Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, Frank Morgan. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Your host and director of the star's own theater, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of your neighborhood Good Gulf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies, welcome back to the Gulf Screen Guild Theater. Right now, the Gulf Theater is the most exciting place this Hollywood of ours has seen in months. Out front in the audience are many of the greatest names in motion pictures and radio. Right beside me here on the stage are Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, and Frank Morgan, whom you'll hear later in tonight's play, The Shop Around the Corner. Behind me, of course, is Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra with Fank Tours conducting. And facing me across the microphone is one of the grandest fellows in Hollywood or any place else, a great actor and the president of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, Gene Herschel. Gene has something to say to you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Gulf Screen Guild Theater means more to us here in Hollywood than you probably realize. Soon, just outside of Hollywood, a community complete in itself will be built a community that will provide a home for the less fortunate men and women of the motion picture industry who, because of some quirk of fate, can no longer provide for themselves. And we owe all this to the Gulf Theater. But the money that would ordinarily go to the stars who appear here, Gulf gives instead to the motion picture relief fund. So as we start our third season, I want to thank the Gulf people and all the stars who have helped make the Gulf Theater our theater. I'm proud to be associated with them. Thank you. Thank you, Gene Herschel. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our first production of the season, we bring you Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, and Frank Morgan in the shop around the corner. the corner, they call this story. And do you know whose shop? Matricek and Company, novelties and leatherware. Best of its kind in Budapest. It really is. Wonderful values at all times. In fact, I don't know how Matricek and Company does it. Uh, Just a moment, please. Uh, Who are you? Uh, uh, me? Well, I'm Matricek. Oh. Yes, well, anyhow, it all happened in my store. Practically all. That's why I'm telling it. Well, this is the story of two young people of whom I'm very fond, Clara and Martin. Clara is very attractive, yes. She's most attractive and uh, an excellent sales girl. But Martin and Clara haven't gotten on at all from the very first day she came to work for me. Professional jealousy on Martin's part because no head clerk likes to have an assistant, especially such a pretty assistant, outsell him. Miss Novak, whatever became of those musical cigarette boxes that nobody ever buys? I just sold the last one, Mr. Martin. Oh. Uh, can I show you something, madam? Uh, no, thank you. I prefer to have the young lady wait on me. Oh. Well, I've had a pretty good day. My sales come to exactly 176 kroner. Mm, my sales come to 250 kroner. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yes. You, uh, you can easily see how these little occurrences would hardly make for a beautiful friendship. But all this didn't seem very important to Martin these days. He had something else on his mind. Martin was living in a romantic plane, far above the everyday routine of Matricek and company. I found that out one day when I chanced to overhear him talking with a fellow clerk named Pirovich. Nice, Pirovich. Yeah. What is it? It's a letter from a girl. Now, listen. My heart was trembling as I walked into the post office. And there you were, lying in box 237. And I took you out of your envelope and read you. I read you right there. Oh, dear friend. What is all this? Well, you see, I I was looking through the ads in the Sunday paper, and I got on the wrong page. I ran across this ad. Here, here, let me show it to you, see? 
Modern girl wishes to correspond on cultural subjects anonymously with intelligent, sympathetic young man. Address, dear friend, Post Office 15, Box 237. Now, we've exchanged four letters, and pair of it, she, she's no ordinary girl. Now, listen to this. Are you tall or short? Are your eyes brown? Are they blue? Now, don't tell me. What does it matter so long as our minds meet? You're right. And it I is know. beautiful. Yes, yes. now, listen. What are men and women for but to rise above the stupid necessities of the eight-hour day? That sounds very nice, Martin, but you really should... Oh, you should. Excuse me, Pervich. Uh, Miss Novak, where do you think you're going? I'm going home, Mr. Martin. It's six o'clock. It's five minutes off six. This store does not close for another five minutes. I'm afraid, Miss Novak, that you don't take your work very seriously. Oh, don't I? No, no, and I don't like your attitude. Listen, let me tell you something. Yes, and while I think of it, I don't like the clothes you've been wearing in the store. For instance, that yellow blouse with the light green dots you had that on was yesterday. A green blouse with light yellow dots. Everybody else thought it was very becoming. Yes, yes. And well, I, I don't remember that I ever remarked about your neckties. And believe me, Mr. Martin, if you think I couldn't say anything about your necktie, so I'll thank you to leave my blouse alone. It's none of your business. Well, I'm very sorry, but Mr. Matichek seems to think it is my business. Oh, yes, that's right. I'm working under you. Well, from now on, I'll telephone you every morning to describe just exactly what I'm going to wear. And before I select my next season's wardrobe, my dressmaker will submit samples for you. Imagine you dictating what I should well, wear. Well, for heaven's oh. sake, I don't care what you wear. If you want to look like a pony in the circus, all right. Listen, I sold as much goods yesterday as anybody else in the place. 197 kronen isn't bad for a rainy Friday three weeks before Christmas. Did you tell that to Mr. Matichek? I did. What did he say? He said, tell her not to come on that blouse anymore. Tell him I won't. I will. Now, come, come, come. Always fighting you do. Why, why don't you try to get along better? I'd like to know who could get along with a man like him. Oh, it is now exactly six o'clock, Mr. Martin. May I go? Yes, Miss Novak. Oh, thank you very much. A stubborn little female. I don't know why we were hired that girl. Now, don't get yourself all worked up. Calm down. Oh, sure, sure. What do I care about a girl like that? I don't know. Oh, get her. Uh, t- tell me more about that girl you've been acting to, you know, dear friend. Hmm? What? Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, girl, but she's wonderful. She's... Well, you know, after a while, in our letters, we came to the subject of love. Well, naturally, on a very cultural level. What else can you do in a letter? No. <laughs> but Pirovich, she's the most marvelous girl in the world. She has such ideals, such a point of view on things. Why, she's so far above the girls you meet today, there's, there's simply no comparison. You really like her, don't you? Well, I hope I will. What do you mean? You love a girl and you don't know if you like her? That's right, Pirovich. That's just the question. You see, I, I, I haven't met her yet. You, you haven't? What? Well, after all this time? I postponed it again and again. I, I'm scared, Pirovich. You see, this girl thinks I'm the most wonderful person in the world, and after all, there's a chance she might be disappointed. Yeah, I see. I see. But tonight, I'm taking the risk. I'm meeting her tonight at 8 o'clock in a cafe. She's going to have a copy of Tolstoy's Anna Karina and a red carnation for a bookmark. Oh, I haven't slept for days. I'm sure she'll be beautiful. Well, not too beautiful. Now, what chance would there be for a fellow like me? Would you want a homely girl? No, 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 no. No, no, just a lovely average girl, that's all. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the clock in the back of my shop striking 8 p.m. And that's exactly the hour Martin was to meet dear friend for the first time at the cafe. Well, when the time came, Martin didn't feel quite so brave, so he asked Pirovich to come along to give him moral support. And even after he got there, he was afraid to go in. He stood with Pirovich in a shadow outside the front window and peered in. He wanted Pirovich to see if he could spot a girl with a red carnation for a bookmark. Uh, not yet. I, uh, oh, oh, there's a beautiful girl. Oh, really? Very beautiful. But no book. Oh, too bad. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I think I see it. Right here under the window. Yeah. Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. And a carnation. Yes, yes. Well, what does she look like? Well, I can't see her face. She's sitting behind the clothes rack. There's a cup of coffee on the table. She's taking a piece of cake. What? She's dunking. Well, why shouldn't she? Oh, all right. Oh, well, what else, Pirovic? How does she look? Well, I can't see her face yet. Don't, don't shove me, Martin. No, no. she's leaning forward now. She, well, can you see her? Yes. Is she pretty? Very pretty. 
She is, huh? I would say she looks... She has a little of the coloring of Clara. Clara? Well, you mean Miss Novak of the shop? Oh, Martin, you, you must admit that Clara is a good-looking girl, and, and personally, I've always found her a very likable girl. Well, this is a fine time to be talking about Miss Novak. Well, if you don't like Miss Novak, I can tell you right now, you won't like this girl. Why? Because it is Miss Novak. <laughs> well, Martin was all for turning on his heel and starting home. But his friend Pirovich pointed out that Miss Novak had written those letters. And it really wasn't fair to the girl to leave her waiting there. Much against his will, Martin finally agreed to go inside the cafe and talk to Miss Novak. Well, hello, Miss Novak. Oh, good evening, Mr. Martin. Well, that's uh, what a coincidence. You know, I had an appointment. I, you haven't seen Mr. Pirovich by any chance, have you? No, no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I'll wait. Do you mind if I sit down? Yes, I do, please. Oh, Mr. Martin, I, I have an appointment, too. Oh, oh. Yeah. Well, there's no harm just sitting here, is there? <sighs> oh, I see you're reading tall stories on a Corinna. Yes? Anything against it? Oh, no, 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 no. I never expected to meet you in a cafe with Tolstoy. It's quite a surprise. I didn't know you went in for the higher literature. Right? Yes. Well, there's so many things you don't know about me, Mr. Martin. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky? No, I haven't. I have. Yeah. A lot of things you don't know about me, too, Miss Novak. You know, you know people... People seldom go to the trouble of scratching the surface of things to find the inward truth. Really, Mr. Martin, I wouldn't care at all to scratch your surface. Probably because I know exactly what I'd find. A handbag instead of a heart, a suitcase instead of a soul, instead of an intellect, a cigarette lighter that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's very well put. I think comparing my intellect with a cigarette lighter that doesn't work, that's, that's a very interesting mixture of... Poetry and meanness. Meanness? No, 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 don't understand me, Miss Novak. I thought I told you I was expecting somebody. Listen, listen, if your party doesn't show up, would, would oh, I... Don't worry about that, Mr. Pa uh, Martin. This party will show up. It's really not necessary for you to entertain me. Well, let me tell you something, Miss Novak. You may have beautiful thoughts, but you certainly hide them. And as far as your actions are concerned, you're cold and snippy like an old maid, and you're going to have a terrible time finding a man to fall in love with you. I, an old maid. So, no man will fall in love with me. Really, Mr. Martin, you're getting funnier every minute. Why, I could show you letters that would open your eyes. No, maybe not. You probably wouldn't understand what's in them. They're written by a type of man so far above you that it's ridiculous. Ha! Huh. I have to laugh when I think of you calling me an old maid. You, you little insignificant clerk. <laughs> So ends Act One of our first Gulf production of the season. During the brief moment before the curtain rises on Act Two, I'd like to tell you some of the many things in store for you here in the Gulf Theater. Next week, for instance, you'll meet Clark Gable, Ann Southern, and Jeffrey Lynn in the great motion picture success, Red Dust. The following week, the pair you've all been waiting for, Vivian Lee and Lawrence Olivier, in Private Lives. In future weeks, among others, you'll hear from Jack Benny, Claudette Colbert, Ernst Lubitsch, Basil Rathbone, James Cagney, Mickey Rooney, and Judy Garland. And now, I know you'd like to hear a word about the man who's really behind the Gulf Theater, your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. He hopes you'll be listening in every week. And he hopes, too, that you'll take advantage of all he can do to give you more miles of motoring satisfaction. He's ready with that helpful Gulf service and with those splendid Gulf products, Gulf gasolines, and Gulf motor oils. Next time you're out driving... Stop in at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc and meet your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. And now we return to the second chapter of our story, The Shop Around the Corner, starring Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, Frank Morgan, Oscar Bradley's music with Frank Tours conducting. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Pryor. I'll take over from here. 
It, uh, it was a terrible blow to Martin when he looked in the window of the cafe and discovered the unknown girl he'd been writing to for so many weeks was none other than his fellow clerk, Clara. But it was more of a blow to Clara when, after Martin left, she waited two hours and her dream prince didn't show up. She took it hard, poor child. You, uh, you know how girls are, especially the dreamer type like Clara. Why, uh, I once knew a girl before I was married that if... Yes, well, that, that's another story. I mean, another program. Uh, Clara, as I say, took it very hard. She even stayed home from work. She was so upset. Martin felt pretty bad about this, so he decided he ought to call on her, strictly in the line of duty, of course. Incidentally, whenever you hear that particular rapping on that particular door, ladies and gentlemen, that means Mr. Martin is calling on Miss Novak. Well, good evening, Miss Novak. Oh, good evening, Mr. Martin. Come in. Uh, how are you, young lady? I'm all right, Mr. Martin. Sorry I couldn't come to work. Oh, that's all right. Now, you must take care of yourself. I'm sure I'll be all right in a day or two. But that doesn't mean that you should neglect yourself. I, you see, I feel pretty responsible for the whole thing. You? Oh, no, Mr. Martin. Oh, no, I think I can relieve your mind. It wasn't your fault at all. No, there's a much bigger reason, unfortunately. A psychological reason. But it's my personal problem, and I'll come out of it. It's just one of those things. Oh, I'm very sorry. It's really a shame that you have to go through all this. But, of course, so long as it's only psychological. Only psychological. Mr. Martin, it's true. We're in the same room, but we are not in the same planet. <laughs> Miss Nowak, I... Although I'm the victim of your remark, I, I must admire your exquisite way of expressing yourself. You, uh... Certainly know how to put a man in his planet. Uh... Yes, come in. Dear Clara, a special delivery letter has just come for you. Oh, really? Thank you, Aunt Anna. I hope it's good news. Uh, well, Mr. Martin, it certainly was kind of you to drop in, but I I don't want to spoil your evening. Oh, no, it's lots of time. You go right ahead of your letter. Don't pay no attention to me. Yeah, well, if you don't mind... Good news? Uh, wonderful news, Mr. Martin. You know, if I weren't feeling so wonderful right now, I could be very mad with you. With me? Why? Why? Because you really spoiled my date the other night. I wasn't so wrong when I asked you not to sit down at my table. You see, this gentleman did come to the cafe. He looked in the window, saw us together, and he misunderstood. Oh, you mean, you mean he thought you and I were friends? Yeah, he know. must have. Listen to what he writes. Uh, tell me, who is this very attractive young man? He's, he's just the type women fall for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry I caused you so much trouble. Oh, I'll straighten it out. Let him be a little jealous. We'll hurt him. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to be much of a man, this friend of yours. He walks away. He's afraid to come over to the table because another man's Mr. sitting there. Martin, he was not afraid. I can assure you he's tactful. He's sensitive. He's not the kind of a man who would sit at a table uninvited. It's difficult to explain a man like him to a man like you. Where you would say black, he would say white. Where you would say ugly, he says beautiful. Mm -hmm. And where you would say oh maid, he says... Listen, here. Our eyes that sparkle with fire and mystery. Vivacious. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says I make him think of gypsy music. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Oh, there's nothing left for me to say except that I wish you a very Merry Christmas, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Well, good night, Miss Novak. Good night, Mr. Martin. Well, Clara showed up for work all right and worked like fury. She told everybody, including Martin and me that she had an engagement for dinner on Christmas Eve, and she was all excited about it. Well, when the shop closed after a record-breaking day before Christmas, only Clara and Martin were left. 
Oh, uh, before you go, Miss Novak, uh, you want to see something? Hmm? Look, look, how do you like this gold locket? Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, well, why don't you try it on? I'd sort of like to see what it looks like on a girl. I didn't know you had a girlfriend. Oh, yes, yes. I, it's probably not easy for you to imagine that somebody would like a man of my type. But... Oh, Mr. Mock, don't let's start all over again. It's Christmas, and I'd like to be friends with you. Listen, do you mind if I tell you something? No, 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 no. When I first started to work here, you know, something very strange happened to me. I found myself looking at you again and again. I just couldn't take my eyes off you. Really? Mm-hmm. All the time I was saying to myself, Clara Novak, what's the matter with you? This Martin is not a particularly attractive man. I hope you don't mind. No, no, no. no. <laughs> and listen, now comes a paradox. I caught myself falling for you. I can't believe it. Yes, Mr. Martin. In those first few weeks, well, there were moments when you could have swept me off my feet. There were, huh? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, you see, really, I was a different girl then. I was rather naive. All my knowledge came from books, and I just read a novel about an actress who, when she wanted to arouse a man's interest, she treated him like a dog. Oh, that's true. You treated him like a dog, all right. Yes, but it, instead of licking my hand, you barked. Oh, well, well, that's all forgotten now, isn't it? <laughs> oh, well, and now you go to see your girlfriend. By the way, is it serious? Yes, yes, very. <laughs> we might... Both be engaged Monday morning. I think we will. Oh, I, I don't want you to misunderstand. In my case, I just say it might happen. You see, he's coming to my house tonight to see me. It's 8 o'clock. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that it will happen. What? How do you know? Oh, uh, we'll go into that. Mr. Martin, what do you mean it will happen? Well, I, uh, I might just as well tell you. He came to see me. Who? Well, your fiancé. He came last night. Now, you shouldn't have told him who I am. You see, I spent a very uncomfortable hour. I, he apparently didn't believe it when you wrote him that I meant nothing to you, you see. I can't get in my head. Come in to see you. Oh, no, that doesn't sound like him at all. Oh, no, but I, I straightened everything out. It's all right. Now, don't worry. In a little while, you'll be Mrs. Popkin. Mrs. Popkin? Popkin? Wasn't that his name? Popkin? I thought that. That's what he told me. Oh, Popkin, oh, yes, yes, that, that, that's right, Popkin. And a very nice fellow, very nice. I congratulate you. Yes, thank you. I, I think he's a very attractive man, don't you? Oh, yes, oh, yes. For his type, I would say, yes, yes. <laughs> would you really classify him as a, a definite type? Absolutely. And don't you try and change him now. Don't put him on a diet. Don't, don't... Would you call him fat? Well, that's a matter of opinion. Now, if, if I were a girl and had to choose between a young, good-for-nothing with lots of hair and a fine, solid, mature citizen, I'd pick Matthias Popkin every time. But he has a fine mind, don't you think? Didn't he impress you as being rather witty? Hmm... Well, I don't know. He uh, struck me as being sort of depressed. But, of course, it's unfair to judge a man who's out of a job. Out of a job? Why, he never told me. Well, I showed you how sensitive he is. But don't worry. Now, he feels that both of you can live very nicely on your salary. <laughs> Terrible. Oh, I'm outraged. I never dreamed he was materialistic like this. If you could read his letters, such ideals. Well, I could quote you passages. To love is is to be two and yet one, a man yeah, and, and a, a woman, woman blended as angels, heaven itself. How did you know that? That's by Victor Hugo. He stole that. <laughs> oh. oh, no. I thought I was the inspiration of all those beautiful thoughts. And now I find he was just copying the words out of a book. He probably didn't mean a single one of them. Sorry you feel this way. I, I hate to think I spoiled your Christmas. That's all right. I guess I really ought to thank you. Well, I guess I'd better be going. Oh, Clara, if I'd known in the beginning how you really felt about me, things would have been different. You, you know what I wish would happen? When your bell rings at 8 o'clock tonight and you open the door, instead of popcorn, I come in. Very sweet of you to try to cheer me up. But I, I think we'd better say good night. You have an engagement. Yes, and so have I. And 
shouldn't be late. Here yet now, thank you not to joke about it. Clara. Clara, couldn't I take his place? Please, you're only making it more difficult for me. Oh, Clara, my darling. Oh, no, you mustn't put your arms around me. Dear, as sweet as Clara, I, I can't stand it any longer. Please take your key. Please. Open post office box 237 no. and take me out of my envelope. Really? And kiss you me. You mustn't. Box 237? Dear friend. That's about the size of it. Of course, they got married. They're very happy now, those two. <coughs> and uh, now, if you should ever need some very fine leather goods or anything of the novel design... <laughs> Thank you, Margaret Sullivan, James Stewart, and Frank Morgan for a really grand performance. And thank you, too, Norman Corwin, for your swell radio adaptation. And now, on with hey, the Roger, show. You know, I... Roger. Yeah? yeah? Remember me? Oh, I'm sorry, but I almost forgot to introduce you. Ladies and gentlemen, meet our new Gulf Theater announcer, Bud Heaston. Say, uh... Say, haven't I seen you in pictures, Bud? Your face familiar. Well, I, I have done some work, Jimmy. But I'm usually just the face on the cutting room floor. Oh, yes. Well, don't fret, young man. We all start that way. Uh, I can remember when I first started in pictures. <laughs> I was, yes, but that's another story. Uh, besides, it's so glamorous I can sell it. Why give it away? So uh, you want to be an actor? <laughs> I'm just the man to help you. Well, gee, that's swell, Mr. Morgan. Uh, right now, however, I'm busy learning to be an authority on gas. Gas? Well, I know enough about gas to fill a balloon. Uh, what? <laughs> well, gasolines, Mr. Morgan. <laughs> For instance, I've been finding out about the new Gulf gasolines, Good Gulf and Gulf No Knocks, and I learned that they've both been stepped up, stepped up to give you faster pickup, more power, and a sweeter-running, quieter engine. And boy, if you've never tried the new Gulf gasolines, you don't know what you're missing. See if you don't notice a real difference the very first time you step on the accelerator. If you use a regular gasoline, try Good Gulf. If you prefer a premium fuel, try Gulf No Knox, the gasoline that is not proof under all normal driving conditions. Remember, you get either one at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc. Drive in and fill up with America's stepped-up gasolines, the new Gulf gasolines. <laughs> Stars of the Gulf Theater are Clark Gable, Ann Southern, and Jeffrey Lim. What happens to them on a rubber plantation in Indochina is the dramatic story of Red Dust. We hope you'll all be listening for the Gulf Theater next week. Starring Clark Gable, Ann Southern, Jeffrey Lim, Oscar Bradley's Gulf Orchestra, with Frank Tours conducting. Until then, this is Roger Pryor saying goodnight, everybody, for your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. Margaret Sullivan is currently working in the Low Lewin production of Flotsam. James Stewart and Frank Morgan appear through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Jimmy's latest picture is Philadelphia Story, and Frank Morgan will soon be seen in Hullabaloo. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.